This reading is from Linda Goodman's Star Signs, Chapter 2, An Apple a Day. An Astrological and Numerological Health Guide, including vegetarianism and other current problems and their esoteric holistic solutions. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. The most persistent memory fragment of the time when I started to talk is the recollection, after I'd learned to walk, of everyone fearing I would catch pneumonia from running out into the rain. Before that, I crawled out into it in pure bliss. They were forever warning, you are sure and certain to catch pneumonia. Only they said it pronouncing the P and a double E to make me laugh. And for years I called it that, pneumonia. You'll catch pneumonia for sure and certain. I would shake my finger and tell my dolls. That little girl and her dolls were the victims of a highly contagious epidemic of medical fear. Astrology teaches with absolute verity that, for one example, if at birth there was no affliction related to the ascendant and or the sixth house of health in Pisces or Gemini and no planet affected by a malefic in Pisces or Gemini, Gemini ruling the lungs and Pisces associated through the mutable cross of sympathetic parts of the body, there is no way that you are ever going to succumb to pneumonia or even pneumonia. Never mind how much the foregoing sentence sounds like Greek to the astrological layman, you can depend on it being true, with no exceptions. With none of these Pisces Gemini afflictions in the birth chart, you could sleep in the rain overnight or be caught in a snowstorm and not contract pneumonia. Likewise, with none of these Pisces Gemini afflictions in your birth chart, and this will drive the American Cancer Society into a frenzy of fury. Whatever your birth aspects, someone smoking a cigarette near you or several people smoking across the room will not cause you to develop lung cancer. The latest dire warning from the white-coated gods of the ACS. The only way that what is called passive smoking can affect you is if you find the smell of tobacco unpleasant. Some do, some don't. I find the odor of alcohol personally offensive, but it's certainly not going to cause me to develop the disease of alcoholism. The exposure of your lungs to the carbon monoxide emissions of cars and buses, compounded by industrial smog, is deadly to all of us but that person lighting a cigarette at a nearby table will not give you lung cancer that so many actually believe such a ridiculous and unfounded claim is an example of how easy it is to hypnotize or program the human brain with the repetitious lies of any kind granted smoking will certainly not benefit your lungs or any other organs which may be the weak links in your body chain and not smoking or smoking low tar cigarettes in moderation and not inhaling is the best choice for your general health. But lung cancer you will not get. Assuming the aforementioned birth chart, even without the latter, you will not be in any way affected by a smoker in the room any more or less than you are affected or offended by the wreck of alcohol fumes or if you are a vegetarian by the stench of butchered animal flesh cooking nearby. Every profession has its flaws and its black sheep. The medical profession is no exception, although its image makers would like us to believe otherwise. Like Caesar's wife, modern medicine has been above reproach for the past half century or longer. It is not always thus. The pendulum swings. During the time of the Civil War and through the turn of the century, the credibility of the medical professions was questionable to say the least. Physicians bought large ads in newspapers and tacked up flamboyant posters, which you've probably seen reproduced on wallpaper in the restrooms of certain restaurants. Offering medical panaceas they claimed would simultaneously cure your sore toe and chronic backaches, stop nosebleeds, cause luxuriant hair to grow on your bald head, 
relieve constipation, banish hives and boils, bad breath and snoring, and resolve your marital problems. It must be admitted that if one elixir did all that, it would surely make anyone's marriage substantially happier. Patients were bled by Dracula-like leeches attached to their skin to remove impurities from their bodies. And when a lone and dedicated physician, Dr. Ignaz Semmelweis, dared to suggest and proved it that fewer women would die from the puerperal infection called childbed fever if the attending doctors and midwives would simply wash their hands in chlorinated lime solution before delivering the laboring mothers of their infants, he immediately became a pariah in the medical community. His death in an insane asylum was the reward bestowed upon him by his professional peers for his stunning contribution to life. Then the AMA was conceived and born. I trust by those who first washed their hands. The powerful American Medical Association, whose members soon aligned in spirit with the FDA, the Federal Drug Administration, in a mutual mission to clean up shabby medical and drug practices, with the goal of changing the carnival sideshow image of both the healers and the pharmaceutical alchemists who compounded the chemicals the former described. Medical schools with strict academic requirements were established, high standards of ethics were imposed, and abracadabra, the tackiness disappeared, replaced by hygiene, hygienic medical practices and dogma, further glamorized by the sterile chrome laboratories and operating rooms of the new, emerging and exciting field of medical research. Slowly, but very surely, medicine grew into the status of almost a religion, supported by congregations of patients in awe of its white-coated high priests, who would not tolerate the slightest criticism of themselves or their profession, and in fact demanded a kind of respect that nearly amounted to worship. Who would dare to contradict anyone who began a conversation with, well, my doctor told me that? Very few. Now the pendulum is swinging in a new and different direction. There are still those sincere medical men and women who are genuinely devoted to the healing work. But as malpractice suits steadily rise and are duly reported in the media, the general public is gradually becoming aware that the warmly remembered family doctor of Norman Rockwell's paintings has gone the way of the dinosaur. We are living in an age of specialists. Medical people who set broken bones, replaced limbs amputated in accidents, repaired scarred and disfigured faces, treat severe burns, remove bullets and dangerously disease or ruptured organs and start hearts beating again after they have stopped, deserve our respect and support, even our affection. Such professional and compassionate ones who perform miracles of healing do exist, here and there, like Dr. James Huperich and Dr. Raymond Wong of Hollywood Presbyterian Medical Center a healing haven with caring ones, like Carmen Sosa, under the enlightened guidance of hospital personnel such as Sai Schneider. I mention only those medical people I've personally experienced, although there are, naturally, a number of others. My son Michael's life was literally saved by these people and this particular medical center. Nevertheless, it's growing undeniably more difficult every year to locate a sincerely dedicated physician. We've been made only too knowledgeable of the many deaths and deformities caused by both the medical and the pharmaceutical professions to feel comfortable in continuing to genuflect to the high priests of medicine with the same degree of awe they expected of us in the past. As a result, a growing number of people are turning to homeopathy and holistic medicine, a revolution seeded by the popularity of books about the sleeping prophet Edgar Casey, and further fruited by the flower children and the back to nature movement of the 60s which hasn't faded into oblivion but is gathering more apostles every year. We don't want to lose our good doctors and we don't want the historic swinging pendulum to swing us all the way back to the elixirs and leeches of the 19th century. 
would like a happy medium, if possible, a change in the direction of medicine able to give us what medicine has always promised and never delivered, permanent good health by giving priority to the practice of prevention over diagnosis and treatment, as does homeopathy and medical astrology. We wouldn't even have the medical profession's current semi-approval of acupuncture if former President Richard Nixon hadn't been ailing when he visited China and became convinced of its effectiveness. No, we don't want to swing back to the 19th century's medical practices. But swinging back to even before then, to ancient China, might not be so bad. There were three types of doctors in ancient China. The first kind merely cured your disease and was the least of the three. The second was an expert in diagnosing an illness, not only after it appeared, but earlier, shortly before it appeared. He was higher on the medical ladder. The most skilled, most venerable, and most respected physician was the one who kept his patients so healthy that they never manifested any form of sickness in the first place. A Taoist ideal. This medical caste system was nothing if not logical. And it went further. A doctor in ancient China, oh, turn back the clock, was paid only when his patients got well, when he had healed them, and in some districts the doctor was under strict obligation to make economic amends or restitution should a patient become worse or continue to be ill under his care, because it was considered that if he had not kept his patients healthy, then their diseases were fully his responsibility. Every time a patient died, a lantern of a certain shape was hung outside the attending doctor's office, and a doctor with too many of these lanterns swinging at the front door could be assured of a slow business. Physicians who complain today about the high insurance caused by malpractice suits would be glad they weren't practicing in ancient China, when the doctors were blamed for everything, unjustly, and the patients given no responsibility for their own mental attitudes causing the illnesses to linger. Why must everything be one extreme or the other? A little of each would be nice with physicians and patients taking equal responsibility for good health. If I may be permitted a respectful suggestion to the medical profession, physicians and surgeons would benefit by paying more attention to the founding father of the profession, Hippocrates, who based his knowledge on astrology. Every doctor, upon being presented with his or her medical degree, in whatever speciality, before taking over the authoritative role of dictating to us about our own bodies, surely a precious and privately owned possession, takes the Hippocratic Oath. Therefore, is it too much to ask that the wisdom of this Founding Father's Council be respected and followed in the practice of medicine? Consider some of that wisdom from Hippocrates. He wrote in his diaries that, He who practices medicine without the benefit of the movement of the stars and planets is a fool. No fussy footing around with Indos or Greek double talks here, much like the well known legal adage that he who represents himself in a court of law has a fool for a lawyer. Hippocrates further stated firmly this warning Touch not with iron that part of the body ruled by the sign the moon is transiting. His counsel may need some interpretations for the medical people who have ignored the astrological wisdom of their founding father for so long they haven't a clue as to how to translate his words. I mean this. One does not perform a surgical procedure with a knife, iron, upon a part of the patient's body which is ruled by, associated with, the astrological sign to which the moon is moving at the time. The moon remains in one sign approximately two and a half days and this information can be easily obtained from an ephemeris calculated by astronomers or a farmer's almanac. According to Hippocrates and proven repeatedly in surgery, disobeying this law will inevitably result in one of the three failures of any surgery performed at the wrong time. 1. Complications including infection. 2. Unusually slow and painful healing and recuperation. And 3. 
fatality. The last of the three possible results of disobedience of the law is behind the too frequent and well-known medical explanation that the operation was a success but the patient died. In the case of three, death can result from any number of causes, including the anesthetic administered. The results of one and two are by far more frequent and result three is rare. Nevertheless, observing the warning of Hippocrates is clearly the wisest course. Some examples. When the moon is in Taurus, ruling the neck and throat, one should not perform a tonsillectomy. When the moon is passing through Scorpio, ruler of the reproductive organs, a prostrate operation or a hysterectomy, removal of the tubes, ovaries or uterus should not be performed. When the moon is in Capricorn or Aries, the former ruling the teeth and bones, the latter ruling the head in general, no dental surgery or other surgery related to the bones or any part of the head should be performed, and so on. Later in this chapter is a list of the various parts of the body ruled by each of the 12 signs. Personally, I never accept anything counseled by anyone without first investigating its validity. And that includes the astrological advice by Hippocrates. But, unlike the medical profession's attitude towards the stars and planets, neither do I disbelieve it until I've checked into it to a satisfactory degree. I investigated the counsel of Hippocrates concerning this particular law and found it to be valid each time. I'll give only a few examples here among the many instances I've checked. Jeff Chandler, a film star of the 50s, entered the hospital to undergo spinal surgery for a slipped disc. It was a common and comparatively simple surgical procedure, requiring only a few days of hospitalization. He died on the operating table from unknown causes. That day, the moon was transiting the sign of Leo, ruler of the heart, the back and the spinal column. Bertha Todd first wife of the producer of Around the World in 80 Days, Michael Todd, who was later married to Elizabeth Taylor, cut her finger on a broken glass. The next day, she decided to go to the emergency room of a Los Angeles hospital and have the cut closed with a few stitches by the intern on duty, a minor bit of surgical attention. On the way to the hospital, Bertha and her Tony stopped for coffee at a Beverly Hills drugstore. When they arrived at the emergency room, Bertha was afraid of the stitching it might be painful, so she required an anesthetic. She was given two, but they weren't effective. The third one took Bertha out of the realm of all pain. She died within minutes. That day the moon was transiting the sign of Gemini, ruler of the shoulders, arms, hands and fingers. With Bertha Todd and Jeff Chandler, the operations were a success, but the patient died. A close friend of mine in Pittsburgh sent both of her children to the hospital at her doctor's suggestion that they have simultaneous tonsillectomies. One was suffering from a severe tonsil inflammation, the other less severe. It was during the time not so long ago when physicians advised wholesale surgery of this kind, which they've only recently counseled against. If you had four children, might as well stuff them all into green nightshirts and yank out their tonsils at one time. Those who didn't need it then was sure to need it eventually. Only later did the medical people decide that tonsils have a job to perform in the body and should never be removed except for excellent cause. Back then, the wholesale removal was recommended. It was more efficient and practical. And there was also the advantage of a cut rate of the surgeon's fee for multiple removal as opposed to the expense of a single tonsillectomy. The day the two children entered the hospital, the moon was transiting the sign of Taurus, which is, as I have mentioned, ruler of the neck and throat. One child developed a severe infection as a complication of surgery, which was touch and go for a while, but he eventually responded to treatment with antibiotics. The other child, a girl, endured a long recuperation, five weeks in the hospital during which time it was discovered that a piece of tonsil remained and had to be removed in a second surgical procedure later. The medical community openly confesses that at least 5% of all deaths in hospitals are 
unexplainable. Could the astrological council of Hippocrates explain them? They will never know, unless they make an attempt to find out. Doctors needn't suddenly leap into practicing the wisdom of Hippocrates by becoming astrologers. That's expecting too much. But the very least of the obligations implied by the Hippocratic Oath would be a carefully controlled observation of the past patient case histories and current surgical operations to check the results. All they need is an ephemeris or an almanac and a few brief words of instruction for any competent astrologer. Since the moon, as I have said, remains in any particular sign for only about two and a half days necessary, many of them are not. Operations need not be postponed for a great length of time by those who respect Hippocrates. If the medical profession won't protect its patients, they can perhaps protect themselves by scheduling their own operations, giving the doctor some plausible excuse such as, if I don't take my vacation this week, I won't be able to take it at all this year. It postpones the surgery only for three days, doctor. Or, it's more convenient for me and for my family to have my surgery next Friday instead of next Tuesday. All any patients need to beat the system is an imaginative excuse, an ephemeris, all almanac, plus a healthy respect for his or her own body, a realization that it doesn't belong to the medical trust to do with it as they please, but to one's own self. It wouldn't be wise to request a rescheduling of surgery by saying, you see, doctor, my astrologer says the medical community isn't quite that enlightened yet on the whole. Maybe soon. Assuming you get lucky and find a doctor who will at least be partially sympathetic to your views about the no-no dates for surgery, he or she may ask you why this should be. Here is the foundation behind the Council of Hippocrates concerning Touch not with iron that part of the body, ruled by the astrological sign the moon is transiting. Even the stuffiest scientists now recognize and realize that the moon controls the ocean's tides as well as the timing of the opening and closing of oysters. Any police chief can tell you that the department dreads the nights of the full moon because it brings on a great tide of criminal activity, filling up the police blotters would double or triple the number of crimes compared to other times. The moon also controls the monthly menstrual cycles of women. Now, since it's a recognized fact that the moon has the power to move around all the great bodies of water in the oceans on earth, and since it's an equally recognized fact that the more than 85% of the human body consists of water, the moon controls your body and emotions to a degree most people don't suspect. Surgery interrupts the as yet undiscovered tidal flows in the body by the unnatural process of opening up the body and allowing air to enter. Consequently, those parts of the body which are ruled by whatever astrological sign the moon is transiting at the time are especially sensitive and vulnerable. That should explain the counsel of Hippocrates sufficiently to even the most closed medical minds let alone to an open-minded physician or surgeon. Medicine has always treated the disease the patient has. Medical astrology and homeopathy treat the patient who has the disease. And there's a vast and vital difference. Your individual birth chart, nativity or horoscope indicated at the moment of your first breath of life on this earth the weak links in your body's chain reactions. That's why Medical astrology is more concerned with the diagnosis and prevention of disease than with treatment. If it's known at birth that a baby's nativity indicates a strong predisposition to diabetes, for example, the parents can control the diet of the small human early enough to prevent the adult the child will become from ever developing diabetes. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure is a true adage. Remember, that the stars incline, they do not compel. Translated, that means that your nativity or horoscope shows which diseases and accidents to which parts of your personal body you are inclined to suffer. If you take the proper preventive measures, these astrological birth warnings will have accomplished their purpose and you need not become ill in the manner indicated in the horoscope as the body's inclination. But if you do not 
take such preventive measures for the reason that you're ignorant of your own nativity's warnings, then your body will be inclined to respect to respond to the electromagnetic pulls and what were originally only possibilities will then become realities. There is nothing fatalistic about astrology. The behavior of humans is where the responsibility for predictive tragedy lies. The refusal to heed the warnings of the birth chart or to take the astrological advice that would prevent the occurrence of all negative events foreshadowed in the horoscope, not just those concerning health. Medical astrology provides the medical profession, if they would only accept and recognize it, with the true original cause of the breakdown of certain organs in each individual's body. Every physical illness, without a single exception, is the result of the initial cause of certain mental and emotional attitudes. As just two of these, for example, the emotional seeding that causes arthritis is resentment, bitterness and frustration held inside uncontrolled and not allowed to express itself outwardly. Be honest, say what you feel or get a punching bag. Heart disease and heart attacks are caused by A. The lonely longing resulting from not being loved. B. The inability to give or return love. C. The inability to love one's self. The emotion of love and human organ of the heart are inseparable. Anger is deadly and swift in its effect. When you become really violently angry with someone or about something, I mean a raging fury, whether or not it's justified and whether or not it's held in or allowed to spill out, it nevertheless creates bile and the bile buildup triggered by the anger seldom takes more than a few months, sometimes only weeks. The result? An excruciatingly painful gallbladder attack and the manifestation of gallstones. It's a dreadful and painful price to pay for anger. Forgiveness is as practical as it is spiritual since it not only strengthens the soul, it keeps the body healthy. If you've ever suffered a gallbladder attack, if you've ever had gallstones, ask yourself with whom or with what were you furiously angry a few weeks or few months prior to the attack. It shouldn't be hard to remember. The memory of anger or rage strong enough to create bile, whether suppressed or expressed, stays with you a while. Think about it. It will surprise you also teach you an important lesson about uncontrollable rage. It also affects the spleen. Why do you think bile and spleen are used to describe violent emotions? Your birth chart infallibly reveals not just your susceptibility to particular diseases and accidents, not just the organs composing your weak links in your body's chain reactions, but also the mental and emotional attitudes responsible for causing specified parts of your body to attract accidents or infection. Beyond this, the birth chart contains the knowledge of the timing of illness and possible accident, indicating when you will be the most vulnerable to one or the other, so that they can be prevented or circumvented to an advanced change in your individual mental and or emotional behavior indicated to be the initiatory cause. If accident or disease has already occurred, the nativity will indicate which mental or emotional attitudes must be changed to reverse the progress of the illness or promote swifter healing of the body parts which have undergone accident. Sometimes, your own instincts can cause such a reversal, producing what doctors call spontaneous remission, the medical term used when no apparent cause for recovery can be found. Astrology accurately analyzes character, personality, physical strengths and weaknesses, and much more, but is equally helpful as a timing device.